Hello, my name is Bob Scheibel. I am the chair of Maine Voices for Palestinian Rights, and our organization is a member of CTN5. The uh, purpose of our organization is to generally educate the public about the struggle that the Palestinians are undertaking to receive their rights under international law. We are very fortunate that we have with us in the studio today Dr. Mark Braverman, who uh, came down to give a talk at First Parish UU Church and also to have an afternoon session with local church leaders and members to talk about how the Christian community can be more effectively and constructively involved in the search and the struggle for peace with justice in the Middle East. Mark, I want to welcome you. Thanks, Bob. It's great to be in Portland. Good. Um, you've written two books, and I've read both of them. The first one, The Fatal Embrace, I read a couple of years ago, and after reading that book, I said to myself, wow, I've got to get that man to come to Portland. And uh, now you're here. And I know in, about you that you are a Jewish American with family roots, deep family roots, in the Holy Land. So I'm interested in knowing what your earlier life was about. Your work now, quite vigorously on behalf of Justice for Palestinians, and I assume you probably weren't born doing that. So what was your earlier life, and what brought you to this <clears throat> point? Uh, no, for sure, I was not born doing that. <laughs> um, I was born to a fairly traditional Jewish family in uh, Philadelphia, mm -hmm. which is a very strong Jewish community, in 1948. Ooh. The big year, yeah. um, if you're Jewish, because that was the year that the State of Israel was declared. Right. Uh, it was also three years after the end of World War II. Mm. Uh, so if you're a Jewish kid born into a fairly traditional Jewish uh, environment in those years, uh, you were raised in a very um, potent combination of traditional mm. Judaism mm. and political Zionism. Mm. Um, the State of Israel had just been declared. Uh, I was taught that um, this was the culmination of Jewish history, that my mm -hmm. people had been redeemed from 2,000 years mm -hmm. of suffering and slaughter. Mm -hmm. The ashes were not cold yet from the ovens of Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the genocide that mm -hmm. we had experienced was still very, very fresh. It still is. Oh, yeah. um, and those two things really meshed together. Mm. Uh, we were supposed to have this land to protect us. Mm -hmm. uh, and so at that point, really, Judaism and Zionism, which is the political ideology that underlies the state of Israel, the idea that the Jews need to have a homeland of their own in historic Palestine, um, that, that really meshed with Judaism. Mm -hmm. I think it's important for people to understand that that was not always true. Before the 40s, before the war, before the establishment of the state, most of organized Judaism, the, you know, the denominations like Christian, like being a Presbyterian or an Episcopalian or a Roman Catholic, mm -hmm. uh, the Jewish denominations were faith communities, religious denominations, just like Protestants and Catholics. As opposed to political communities. Yes, yeah. not, not, not a national people. Mm. We talked about the people of Israel, right. but that was really just like talking about being part of the body of Christ or being a Presbyterian mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. with a history. Mm -hmm. um, and most organized Judaism was officially non-Zionist or anti-Zionist. Mm. They said, why would we want to be connected with a nationalist, ethnic nationalist movement? We want to be a faith community just like you Protestants. It's not a good idea to mesh religion with nationalism. Jews were, you know, were politically progressive, liberal, even you know, way left. Lots of Jews were communists. Mm -hmm. Nationalism was not supposed to be part of our religion. All that changed in the late 40s. Mm -hmm. When you, if to be a Jew meant to believe in the state of Israel as an inextricable part of your identity, your belief system, and if you were not on that train, you were outside of the pale. Mm -hmm. And all of this because of Hitler and the Holocaust. Uh, 
Is that right? It's because of Hitler and the Nazi Holocaust. It was because of all kinds of geopolitical things that were going on at the time having to do with England mm. and, Russia. And, and Russia and France and mm. what the West and, and the United States and what the West wanted to be doing in what they called the Middle East, Western Asia, mm -hmm. the quote, Arab world. And the idea of Israel as a kind of a Jewish, well, white European enclave mm. fit uh, to some extent with some of those plans. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not all political. A lot of it has to do with religious belief. There is a deep uh, the Zionism, the idea that the Jews are a separate people, different than others who belong in a separate place. Just seems to me like a kind of anti-Semitic idea, but maybe we can talk more about that. Mm -hmm. That's fairly deeply rooted in Western Christian culture, mm -hmm. uh, especially in British culture. And Britain, of course, had the mandate for Palestine. So I think that um, to uh, favor the Jews and uh, sort of give it to the uh, and give, giving away to the Jews what maybe belonged to the Arabs, the mm -hmm. indigenous population, the Palestinians who lived there was not such a bad, it didn't seem like such a bad idea to a Western oriented political mm -hmm. reality. Mm -hmm. So you were brought up firmly in that mm -hmm. belief set. What, uh, what brought about a change? Short story, I met the so-called enemy. <laughs> you know, uh, part of being raised as, as a Jew, and I need to make it clear, uh, and I do so much, so much talking about Christianity and Jesus and his political context and all that. People sort of wonder when, I've, when was it that I converted and I still a Jew. <laughs> I am certainly a Jew, it's part of my identity. Um, mm. um, and I love being a Jew, and I value my culture and my tradition very, very highly. It's an it's extraordinarily important, mm -hmm. and rich, invaluable tradition. Right. But like growing up in any tradition, and that would include uh, being an American or being a Christian or being a Muslim, even being a Buddhist, it has its dark side, yeah. usually having to do with exclusivism and God's with us and not with the others. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and Judaism definitely has a dark side, especially since we have, uh, we feel we have the right to claim so much victimhood and so much suffering. So part of what I was brought up with was a sense of um, having to know that the rest of the world out there was dangerous, unfriendly, and just an inside secret, not really as good as us either. Oh. <laughs> There's that sense of exceptionalism and entitlement. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with that as well, and I learned that I had two enemies key primary enemies. One was German people because of what they had just done to us. Right. And the other was the Arabs, as we called them, because of what they would do to us if we didn't have Israel. Mm. I was brought up to fear those people and to see them as the bad guys. Mm -hmm. um, you know, growing up as an American in those years, along with the commies, right? Yeah. I was brought up as a Southern Baptist believing that the Catholics that's right. Was that way. <laughs> exactly. And if John F. Kennedy were elected president, in fact, I gave a speech in my high school mm -hmm. civics class about why they should vote for Nixon. This is in Ch North Charleston, South Carolina, because if Kennedy was elected, the Pope was going to rule America. Really so rule. Okay. that was my little uh, nutshell of um, exactly exclusiveness right. and the other is enemy. So we all, we all have to, we all are brought up, many of us are brought up with that kind yeah. of thing, and we have to overcome it. Yeah. It was something in me that always said, you know what, I do not want to base my identity on who the bad guys is, uh, mm. who the bad guys are, and who it is I'm supposed to hate yeah. and fear. Right. Um, so when I met the so-called enemy, when I met the Palestinians, that's what turned me around. Hmm. I was ready for it, something in me had always rebelled against the idea that these Arabs were terrible. How'd you happen to meet them? I mean, you meet some over here? Or over I went on an interfaith pilgrimage there are many such that will take people to um, Israel and Palestine, Israel, Palestine, whatever you want to call it. I mean, we can get to the politics of it. There's one state there now. It's called Israel. Yeah. It owns it all, and it's an apartheid state. That's the reality that we've got mm -hmm. now. So call it Israel, call it Palestine, call it Israel and the occupied territories. It's hard to find what to call it because there are so many illusions and lies out there about what it really is. Okay. It's basically a colonial 
enterprise. And Israel's got it all. And there are these enclaves of Palestinians, sort of like South Africa mm -hmm. under apartheid. Anyway, I went there with an interfaith uh, delegation, actually with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, not that long ago, back in 2006. And we went everywhere and met everybody, Israelis, uh, Arab and Jewish, Palestinians, Muslim and Christian in the West Bank and in Gaza. I met these Palestinians. And not only were they not my sworn enemy, they were happy to see me. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming, you know? And, you know, if you've ever tried to refuse Arab hospitality, you know how to start, you know, international Yes, episode. my wife and I have been there three times now in the last four okay. years. And, uh, yeah. So it's ahalan was ahalan. Please come into my house, drink, drink my coffee, and you do not say no. Uh, and now, angry, bitter, yeah. sad, yeah. puzzled, all of that. Hate, no. Fear, no. Mm. Thank you for coming. And I learned the other narrative. I mean, the 1948 narrative that I had learned, we called, we called it the War of Independence or the War of Liberation. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, a war of self-defense. The uh, hordes of Arabs from five countries were swept into the young state to drive the Jews into the sea, and they heroically defended themselves. Now, there were hostile Arab armies that did come in but they were, unmatched. They, were, they were no match for um, the well-armed, fairly well-organized Jewish forces. Mm -hmm. and, um, and according to, um, I'm sure you must have read Ilan Pape's book, The uh, Ethnic, Ethnic Cleansing, Cleansing of Palestine. And according to that book, the Arab regulars actually didn't come in until, what was it, May 14th or 15th of 48, after about a quarter of a million Palestinians had already, had already been, driven out. been driven out of their homes. It was an ethnic cleansing operation, yeah. and it was something that they had been planning, Ben Green had been planning since the 30s. Mm. So there's a whole other narrative. I mean, but the, the key narrative that we didn't learn, no matter what, you know, who started what, and who, how many people, I mean, the key piece of the narrative was that this was not a country without a people for a people without a country. Right which was this old uh, Zionist um, mm -hmm. uh, motto. There was an indigenous population. And for this colonial enterprise called Zionism, that was a problem. What do you do with the fact that there are people there? Well, you lie about the fact that they're even there. Mm -hmm. You lie about the fact that they actually have a vibrant culture, mm -hmm. an economy, agriculture. I was taught that this was a barren desert with a couple of primitive people with camels running around. Yeah. And you still hear that today. You still I hear that. people still making that claim. Right. So I learned that there was, there was, is a people, a culture, and that they were driven out to make room for Israel. Hmm. Now, this presented me with a significant conflict because I was raised on it, and I had lots and lots of family there. I mean, you talked about my family roots. My grandfather was born in Jerusalem around the turn of the 20th century, mm -hmm. around 1900. Uh, and uh, he emigrated to the United States, so I'm a second generation American, but my, I, had a huge fa I have a huge family there and friends and an emotional connection to the place. Sure. And um, for me to have that turned upside down and to have that romantic dream. And Israel is a beautiful place and it's a beautiful culture that people started to build there. It's now turned to, I don't want to say the word on the radio, on TV. It's the, the dream has turned into a nightmare. It's a very, very troubled sick society because mm -hmm. compare it to South Africa under apartheid. Compare it to Jim Crow, the Jim Crow South, mm -hmm. where deep, deeply embedded in the culture is racism and fear and hatred and inequality. That's Israel today. I say this with enormous sadness. Yeah. So my appeal to American society and to the churches in particular, and that's a political strategy. I think the churches are, can be quite powerful as they show they can be with the civil rights movement and with the anti-apartheid mm -hmm. movement. My appeal is uh, 
you know what you need to do hmm. about this kind of a scenario as soon as you learn the facts, which are sort of the reverse of what we've been taught of yes. the Israelis and the Jews as the victims and the Palestinians as these bloodthirsty terrorists, right? which also fits into the dominant American narrative, mm. slash civilizations, it's a perfect storm. Yeah. We're very, very ready to believe as Americans that A, there's this dark, evil people out there that worship another god, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and that hate our freedom. Mm. And we have this bastion of good white Judeo-Christian dem democratic folks, and that's called Israel, and that's our friend, and they're going to protect us from these terrorists. Right. That's A. And, and B, you know, that the Bible says so. I mean, there are lots of Christians who believe that, yeah, the Jews need to have Jerusalem because that means Jesus is coming tomorrow. Yes. As soon as we get rid of that last, those last non-Jews. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, we, we need to educate Americans about that. We need to understand that it's not in our national interest to be seen as in lockstep with Israel because it makes the rest of the world hate us. Right. Which, I mean, what else is new about American foreign policy? I mean, that's what we always do, but this is, this is probably the worst case because we are funding Israel. I mean, Israel is the, Israel's, uh, uh, depending on how you count, Israel's less than 10 million people. It is the largest single recipient of U.S. foreign aid in the world, a place the size of New Jersey, mm. with less people than New Jersey. Mm. So, I mean, it's, it's not good. It's yeah. not good for America. You know, you mentioned the civil rights um, in the South. I grew up in the South, and I grew up a racist. Not a horrible racist. In other words, the N-word was just not spoken in my household. Mm. We didn't use that word. But we definitely believed in separate but equal. Now, I never bothered to notice whether or not there really was equal. It was just separate. And we, we were pretty convinced that those people were less than us. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I went off to college that I discovered I was a racist. And during that period, I began to speak to those around me. And once I started teaching, as a graduate assistant, I would talk in my classes, but I never really did anything. I was, I kind of kept my nose in the books. I had to get my PhD, my master's and PhD. And I wasn't about to go down south on Freedom Summer because I knew how nasty those people were down right. there. And I was, I, I wasn't about to do it. When I became aware of this issue, uh, I discovered, my God, this is, there's racism here. And it was part of what has made me become so committed to it. I thought, okay, this racial issue, I'm not going to sit out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be active mm -hmm. in it. And mm -hmm. so it was my history as a racist and as racist South mm -hmm. that really has motivated me in large part to work so much on this. Now, you uh, didn't have to move into working with Christian churches, and I know you do a lot with what is called Kairos. Would you explain what Kairos is and then Kairos USA? So Kairos is a, um, a Greek word, it's from the New Testament. It's what um, John the Baptist said when he said, uh, come and uh, the, the time is fulfilled. That was the word that was used, Kairos is the time. It's a time when history mm -hmm. opens. Something new is gonna happen. History opens because something revolutionary has to happen because things are so bad. And that was, that was the coming of Jesus. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word that's deeply rooted in, in, in Christian uh, uh, lore and Christian theology. Um, the South Africans picked it up in the mid-80s when the South African churches wrote a prophetic document coming out against apartheid saying that it was a heresy. And they said that the Kairos is the moment of grace and opportunity when God issues a challenge for decisive action. So they use that very word. They use the word kairos. This is the kairos. Mm. And they called their, their document was called the challenge to the church, mm. a commentary on the current political situation in South Africa, Kairos, South Africa. That was in 1985. It was uh, a game changer because when the church has turned against the regime, and of course the churches had been collaborating with the regime saying, yeah, we can have a kinder, gentler apartheid. We can separate black and white in churches. And things. They said no to that. And that was... Mm. Within seven years, apartheid was over. Yeah. The Palestinians in 2009, a broad uh, ecumenical group of Palestinian church leaders and activists, uh, Christian Palestinians, um, 
got with the South Africans that it's time for us to write our own Kairos document. And they came out with it in 2009. You can Google it, find it on the internet. I'm actually not speaking to you, I'm speaking to our audience. And that's K-A-I-R-O-S. Okay, so if you go to kairosusa.org, <coughs> you can, we've got a page in there that shows that whole history of the Kairos documents, um, chiefly the South African, the Palestinian, and then there have been Kairos documents that have come out of other cultures oh. in Asia, really? rest of Africa, South America. Again, especially to your point earlier, people who are connect with it in terms of their own indigenous contextual struggles. Mm -hmm. So the Filipinos, the kind of Kairos theology, which is kind of a liberation theology that they're writing, blow your socks off. It's amazing, wonderful stuff, because they know. They know what it means to be colonized, yeah. They know what it means to have an indigenous population that is struggling against the sort of the, the colonial power that has taken over their country, their own people. And they're aware of the Palestinians' they are, plight? They are, they are, like you, they are attracted to it. They want it. They, they, they want to connect to it because it helps put them more on their own feet in terms of their own struggle. This was true for the South Africans as well. Yes. It's true now for the Brits. And it's true for the Americans. So we started Kairos USA as a response to the Palestinian call. So who in, who in Palestine started it? It wasn't the Palestinian Authority, I'm pretty sure. No, it was not the Palestinian <laughs> Authority. Pal if, yeah. Palestinian Authority does not work for the Palestinian people, yeah. as you know. Yeah, Palestinian yeah. Authority is kind of like Vichy France. Mm -hmm. They yeah. were not working for the French. You know who they were working for. Yeah. They were working for the occupier. Right. Palestinian Authority was set up by Israel, the United States, and the Western powers in 1993 as part of what was supposed to be um, an agreement that would lead to the establishment of a sovereign Oslo. Palestinian state. That was Oslo, because yeah. it, it was written in Oslo, uh, Norway. Um, no, PA is not working for the Palestinian people. These are the churches that are stepping out prophetically, saying, um, because we are Christians, we are, by our faith, required to resist tyranny and evil. The occupation of our land, the ethnic cleansing and oppression of our people is a tyranny. It is evil. We must resist it nonviolently, reaching out in love, as in Christian love, to our enemy, to our occupier, saying we will live together with you. You must stop doing this to us. You know, it, it's interesting because um, you're talking about the Christians there. and. Some people will think, how did Christians get over there? I know. And <laughs> just, I will confess that a few years ago, sure. a Palestinian woman was visiting in our home. She was a roommate of our daughter who was getting a degree at Brandeis. And I was asking her about her religious background, and she said, well, I'm Christian. And I was so ignorant as to say, well, um, did, did your family meet missionaries? Right, yeah. And she looked at me like I was stupid, which of course I was, and she said, Bob, we've always been Christians. Don't forget, that's where it started. That's where it started. They've it, been there all along. All along. You know, look, you know, I'm, I, I'm an American Jew. Genealogically, I don't have any connection historically to the Jews who lived back in Bible times. Um, uh. Uh, European Jews and most of the Jews in this country are from European stock like me. Uh, we're probably, we're a converted Caucasian tribe from the 8th century. Mm -hmm. But the, the, look, Americans, again, it's back to our own sort of American uh, Western-centric uh, perspective about things. Um, Palestinians are Arabs. Arabs are all Muslim. So Palestinians are Muslim. Yeah, yeah. We know nothing. And the, the, what Palestinians, the joke is, and it's not, it's not a joke, when, when you ask a Palestinian Christian, well, when did you convert? You know the, the stock answer? Yeah. Uh, that would have been Pentecost. <laughs> 2,000 years ago. <laughs> That's when we converted to Christianity. Yeah. We were the first Christians. Jesus was a Palestinian Jew yeah. living under Roman occupation. Yeah. His whole ministry was about nonviolent resistance. Okay. To the, uh, to the evil of occupation. That's what my books are know, about. It just blows the whole thing over. That's very much in, um, in this book, A Wall in Jerusalem. Um, but let me, uh, before we run out of time, let yeah. me ask you this. I know you came back from that trip and you wanted to speak in Jewish synagogues and you wanted to begin to work with people. And 
you found yourself uh, not as welcome as you had wanted to be, but you found, I think, more welcome in various progressive Christian churches. How do you work with Christian churches, with Christian leaders, with Christian pastors who have been engaged for some time now, quite honorably, in the interfaith dialogue ever since the Holocaust saying, oh my God, we've been looking at the Jews as, as the Christ hate killers. And so they've been forging links with Jews and now they're afraid to criticize Israel, right? Because they might lose their interfaith dialogue. How do you speak to people yeah, like that? Yeah, and, and, and Bob, that really is the core issue for Christians. Mm. Um, because uh, they will come up to me and they'll say, listen, Mark, understand what you're saying, we agree with you, we understand we need to do something about Palestine. Tell me how I can do that without being called an anti-Semite. Tell me how I can do that without blowing up my relationship with the rabbi with whom I have this, this connection mm -hmm. in our community, you know, I'm the, I'm the pastor. Tell me how I can do that without creating huge family issues with my Jewish son-in-law. Right, okay. And my answer is, I don't have a good answer for you. Mm -hmm. I don't know that you can, and you have to decide that for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, there, this is a tough, tough issue for that very reason. The Jewish-Christian re uh, reconciliation is a precious relationship for Christians because Christians bear so much of a sense of responsibility, okay. well-deserved, for yeah. Jewish suffering for 2,000 years. It was, after all, the Christians who did that, not the Palestinians. Yeah, not I mean, the Palestinian Arabs. That, were. The Palestinians are paying the price. Right. For church so what, anti Semitism, Jews, for, I mean, for Western Christians. civilization, Western Christianity, yeah. having kicked the Jews around for 2,000 years. That's all true. Yeah. And the problem is that powerful interests in Israel and in this country are playing that card very powerfully to try to intimidate and stop this movement for justice. And so, what I tell my Christian friends is I can't tell you what to do, but I tell you that, but I think it's a cross to pick up. And if you don't want to pick up that cross, find another cause because you that that price will be there for you to pay and you have to decide what's right mm, yeah well this is maybe getting to a good point to kind of wrap up if somebody's interested in knowing more um, give us that website again yeah it's kairos usa k-a-i-r-o-s usa dot org okay it's a good uh platform and jumping off point to discover all kinds of things that are on the internet okay. about this movement and if people want to know any more about our work here in Maine, uh, they should go, or if you haven't been there, go to www.mvprights.org. That's Maine Voices for Palestinian Rights, and that's our website. And we also have a Facebook page. So, Mark, thank you very much for coming to Portland, Maine. You're from the other Portland, and um, we claim priority. <laughs> you were here first. <laughs> we're glad you came to the uh, original and the true Portland. Glad to have you here and thanks for coming. Thank you, Bob.